Whoops. You're on. Thank you. Well, good morning again, everyone. And for those maybe who've just joined us in the last uh, minute or so, uh, once again, can I just say a huge thank you to uh, U3A and to Sue for the, the kind invitation to be here this morning. I'm I'm not doing rock climbing, by the way. I'm just sat in my uh, conservatory today, and this is the sort of the, the backdrop. So I, I hope it's not causing anybody uh, too many problems with the jigsaw effect. Um, if I may, just let me introduce uh, myself, first of all, so that you, you know who I am and where I'm coming from in, in terms of what I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, I now work for the University of Chester, and I'll talk about that in, in a, a little moment. But uh, for 30 years between uh, 1985 and 2015, I was a police officer with the Chester Constabulary. Uh, I joined in 1985 at the age of 19, having, I'm afraid to say, uh, not done particularly well levels at that time but fortunately for me uh, the police service in the mid 1980s was more concerned with things like how uh, healthy and fit you were and, and I was pretty handy in that uh, that category thankfully and all I needed then was the equivalent of what you would now call seven GCSEs or seven O levels and I, and I had those so into the police service at the age of 19 uh, I went I worked in Chester a uh, fine city for which I have a, a, a huge amount of, of love and affection and in those days, uh, when when one started their police career, you were expected to uh, walk the beat, which is something that uh, people only do very rarely, I think, these days. So my my beat was the city centre of Chester, and I thought it was wonderful walking around the streets, uh, talking to people, interacting with people, all sorts of different questions and problems. Obviously, people causing problems on the streets as well. So you know, arresting people for all manner of offences at that time. And I very much got into the idea of uh, enjoying criminal investigations and they fascinated me and, and the techniques even that were available in those days obviously far more now which we'll talk about later but the idea of starting an investigation from scratch uh <clears throat> doing an investigation working through finding out what had gone on helping the victim uh, maybe in some cases getting their property back or whatever that whole idea appealed to me so after about three years of my police service i became a, a trainee, first of all, a trainee detective within the Criminal Investigation Department or the CID. And I did my uh, traineeship in a place called Ellesmere Port, just seven miles down the road from Chester, a very interesting place with some interesting characters. And having completed that training, I got a job as a detective constable on CID at Chester in 1992. And I sort of worked my way through the ranks uh, of the police service uh, between uh, 1992 and about 2005 uh, working in different departments in different ranks uh, within both uniform and the CID until eventually I was promoted to chief inspector in 2005 and I became uh, what's known as a senior investigating officer or an SIO for homicide or murder on what was then the newly formed uh, major investigation team in Cheshire Constabulary so the, the whole idea of the uh, MIT as it was known was that we would deal not only with uh, murders, but, but also with other uh, suspicious or unexplained deaths. Also that we would uh, liaise with the health and safety at work uh, team, the, uh, the HSE, uh, over deaths in the workplace. And that we would also liaise with Cheshire's coroner over any deaths abroad uh, in which we were capable of uh, uh, lending a hand or giving any help. And that's a bit more complicated area, which I probably won't touch on today. So it was quite a broad range and, and an awful lot of, of cases we got involved in, uh, which would look suspicious initially, would turn out not to be at all with uh, a degree of investigation. Again, something I'll, I'll talk about shortly. So I was an SIO. Uh, <clears throat> I worked on a, a number of, of cases between 2005 and 2015. Uh, I led the investigation into the death of the guy called Peter Harris over at Sandbach. Uh, I led the investigation into the death of a lady called Lorna Whittingham at the hands of her own son in Crewe. Uh, I led the investigation into the murder of a man called Kevin Walsh over at Warrington, quite a hideous investigation that was. And also I led the investigation into the death of a little girl of four called Naomi Hill, who was from Cons Quay, uh, and who was uh, unfortunately killed uh, by being drowned in the bath at the family home in Cons Quay by her mother, Joanne, who was subsequently convicted of her murder. And in the latter period of my police career, I became what's known as a mentor to other SIOs. So the, the theory was, and I'm not sure it was entirely true, but the theory was that because 
I'd led a number of investigations myself. I was then capable of sitting on the shoulders of uh, up and coming SIOs and hopefully to mentor them, uh, to you know, give them some guidance, let them run the show because it's very important that they do and that no one else interferes. But be there as a, a kind of a guiding hand, if you like, just to ask any questions or give any, any pointers, any advice that could help them develop themselves as SIOs because it is really, really important that you are allowed to develop in your own right to develop your own personal style and obviously to develop the way in which you manage the team of people around you and that kind of takes me nicely in, into the team of people around you because many of you i'm sure will have watched television dramas about you know the role of the sio and people leading investigations in, into murder etc and i'm afraid uh, to, to say that television dramas are, are some uh, way from the truth and they have to be I understand that TV dramas have to have a couple of central characters. Uh, they, they, they haven't got the time to introduce 25, 30, 40 different people and all the different roles that they undertake during a murder investigation. But it gives a false impression. It gives the impression that people like me in the role of the SIO actually do everything. They take all the witness statements, they arrest everybody, they interview everybody. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You know, you have a, a team <clears throat> around you I was fortunate as, as the SIO to have a, a fantastic team of people, all highly skilled individuals, each an expert in his or her own chosen field, uh, who you could call upon at, at different times to, to pull all those pieces of that jigsaw together and to help you uh, in the end to present, hopefully, a case that was going to stand scrutiny at the Crown Court, because that's what it's all about. Um, each of those officers would have a specific role. You might have somebody who was highly trained in interviewing uh, witnesses or victims. You might have somebody who was highly trained in interviewing suspects. You could have somebody who's very highly trained in examining things like uh, mobile telephone records, etc., banking records. So <clears throat> very, very important that all those key roles are brought together during an investigation of that nature and of that magnitude uh, in order to make sure that nothing is missed. Because, you know, the, the, the key words that I was taught as a junior detective, uh, attention to detail, and that was something which my uh, tutor detective used to drum into me, often by hitting me around the head, because in, in the late 80s and early 90s, you were allowed to hit trainees, and I used to get hit all the time, which hurt quite a lot because he was a big bloke. Um, but attention to detail is what he always used to say to me. And apart from the hitting, which I could have done without, the, the actual... That the aspect itself, the, the, the key point, is that you should scrutinise everything. And there's another saying in, in investigation as well, that's the ABC principle, which I'm sure some of you will have heard of, where you assume nothing, you believe nothing, and you challenge or check everything. Uh, and that works well. Do you have a qu quick example of, of what I mean by that? Uh, <clears throat> I went down to Crewe uh, some years ago now to a report of a serious assault. And I was on call uh, and what had happened, two guys had a fight on a car park and one had got the better of the other to such an extent that he put him in hospital. Uh, and this guy was on a life support machine and was expected to die, hence uh, my involvement and the reason I was called out. And I was brought down to the car park where this assault had taken place. And, and up on a pole in the corner of the car park was this fantastic looking CCTV camera. And I said to the officer who'd taken me down to the scene because I didn't know crew very well, I said, oh, I said, the CCTV there. I said, can we, uh, can we get the, the footage so we can see what's going on? And he said to me, oh, it doesn't work, boss. I said, it doesn't work. I said, how do you know it doesn't work? And he said, <clears throat> well, I've been told by the inspector, obviously a high-ranking officer, who's been told by the superintendent, a very high-ranking officer, that the camera's not working. And I knew the superintendent personally. I'd, I'd worked with him many times. So I went to his office and I said, uh, I'll mention his name. I said, uh, this CC, how do you know it's not working? And he said, uh, oh, he said it was mentioned to me uh, a couple of months back. He said, and I've just been telling people ever since. I said, well, what have you done about it? Have we taken any steps to get it sorted out or, or repaired? He said, oh, I'm not sure. So I sent an officer to the CCTV control room to ask them, you know, what's going on with this camera? What's the problem? Uh, and 45 minutes later, I was actually watching footage of the fight. And that was because the camera wasn't broken. It had never been broken. It had all started off as a myth which had then personified itself and had been spread around the police station. And, and the more senior the officer who'd said it wasn't working, the more junior the officers had believed them, nothing had been done. 
Uh, and in fact, uh, it, it had never been broken in the first place. So the ABC principle is something which I've always tried to work to, never assumed that anything is right, always kind of believed something when I've seen it uh, and made sure that we, we check every single piece of information, try and corroborate it, try and cross-reference it to make sure uh, that, that it's actually right. And again, that it will stand at scrutiny uh, in court. So <clears throat> we, we use tried and tested techniques uh the the way we investigate murder in this country really hasn't changed much uh since i first started working on murder investigations as a detective constable in the early 90s the only thing that has changed is the technology so the police use a system uh, an investigation management system called homes h-o-l-m-e-s and that stands for home office large major inquiry system and it's a standalone system which the the police enter into it all the information which they uh, gather during a murder investigation now you don't unfortunately press a button and out comes a piece of paper with the name of the killer on it that'd be great wouldn't it It'd be really good if that was the case but it isn't the case but what it is it's a system whereby lots of things can be cross-referenced and checked and it means that hopefully if the people operating the system and using it are, are up to scratch it hopefully means that nothing uh, will be missed so we use that management system uh, in terms of the major incident room. All the information that's, uh, that's found during the investigation comes into the major incident room. And there's a small group, a very small uh, and quite, I think, privileged group of people within the major incident room or MIR, as it's known. About half a dozen people who I would expect uh, <clears throat> would know the circumstances of the case inside and out. That's the SIO. Obviously, that's me. Uh, I would expect anybody in my role would have read all the statements that are brought into the incident room, any bits of information, and would be fully aware of the circumstances of the case right up to the minute. The SIO has a deputy, uh, he or she, I would also expect, would know the case to exactly the same standard as the SIO, because if they don't and the SIO gets run over by a bus tomorrow, then we've got problems, because we need someone to step into that leadership role who actually knows the case as well as the person who was leading it previously. So those two people are very important. Then you have the office manager. Uh, he or she is usually the rank of inspector. And I would expect that person as well to be fully au fait with all the circumstances of the, of the offence itself and all the information again, right up to the minute, just in case the SIO needs something that they may have picked up on that he or she hasn't, can happen. And then there are several key roles within the incident room, which again are performed sometimes by officers of lower rank, but nevertheless, just as important logistically uh, from, from the perspective of putting the investigation together. So <clears throat> you'll have somebody called the receiver. And as you might expect from the term, that person receives every single item that is recovered during the investigation. And it's his or her job to read through them, make a very quick assessment of anything that might be urgent, that might need to be done. Uh, and if that is the case, then they'll, they'll get that role in. But they read through every single item, document, statement that's recovered during the investigation. Uh, and, and they then are looking for things which they want to prioritise or things which they think will be significant to the investigation. Then you have somebody called the action allocator. And it's his or her job to ensure that all the actions that are raised, the things that need to be done, they're prioritised into a format that's, again, select which of the ones need to be high priority, which need to be done quickly and which can wait and actually sometimes which can be pended and not done at all they still need to be considered at some point but they're not urgent but they're pended and put away so they don't get lost they remain in a file where they can be accessed at any time and checked <clears throat> and if something else does come to light in the future which means they need to be brought out and reactivated then that's fine uh, the statement reader again is as the, the name would suggest reads every single statement that comes into the investigation they read through them and they raise any further actions which they think might require to be done. Maybe because there's a piece of information missing from the statement or perhaps because the witness mentioned somebody else who we haven't seen yet that was there at the time. We need to go and speak to them, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and then th those, those sort of key roles together with one other role, and that's the role of the exhibits officer. And again, he or she will receive and look after every single exhibit that's, for example, a cigarette end or 
a piece of paper with writing on it, so a document or so, something that comes in that's going to be physically used and, and shown as evidence. The exhibits officer will keep all of those, uh, will register them all, will ensure they're kept safely and securely and can't be touched with or interfered with or contaminated by anybody else. And what will happen is that all those key players will meet uh, every so often, certainly uh, in the case of a, a live and ongoing and new murder investigation, they maybe meet every day or sometimes more than once in a day, just to get an idea of what's coming into the investigation, what we've got, what we need to prioritise uh, and what we need to do next. And, and those sort of key players really are the only ones <clears throat> who I would expect would know everything about the case. The rest of it works a bit like a, a wheel or a spider's web coming out from the centre. And there'd be lots of people who'll know certain things about certain aspects of the investigation, but not so many who will know everything. Uh, a, a very privileged position, as I say, and one I always took extremely seriously. And that's why when people ask me now, from sort of a commentator's perspective, what do you think about this case on the TV or this case on, on the radio or the internet? I don't know. Uh, and I don't know because I'm not there. I don't know because I'm, I'm not part of that intricate, close-knit team that helps to run the investigation. And uh, I can only sit on the outside like most other commentators with a little bit of experience and, and guess what they're doing based upon uh, my knowledge from days gone by. But what I'm going to do now is to just bring up one of two little presentations I intend to use today just to talk you through uh, how the SIO actually uh, runs an investigation and what goes on in his or her mind and I'll just check with Sue when I share this uh, this screen that we can actually see uh, what it is that we uh, we need to, to be doing so Sue can everybody uh, see that just while I blow my nose please excuse me okay the screen is now focused everyone can see you wonderful okay so golden hour and associated issues. Thank you. So the, the, the golden hour uh, is, is not something uh, which we talk about in the same way as uh, Simon Bates, that well-known Radio 1 DJ who used to play uh, music and whatnot uh, in, in about the 1980s. The, the golden hour uh, is a term which is uh, used to describe the, the principle that effective early action can secure significant material that would otherwise be lost to the investigation. And that comes from the ACPO, or Association of Chief Police Officers, Murder Manual of 2006. It's now known as the National Police Chiefs Council, is ACPO. But the Murder Manual 2006 is still in existence. It hasn't been rewritten. Uh, and that's an indication, perhaps, of how, what's in that document. And it's available online. It's no big secret. If you, if you search on open source, you'll find the ACPO Murder Manual and if you're that way inclined, you can read through it from cover to cover, something I've probably done a couple of times during my career. Uh, and that's where the, the term comes from. So what it's effectively saying is do something. Don't sit on your hands. Don't, don't wait for the information to come to you. Don't wait for that evidence to come knocking on, on your door and present itself. Get out of your chair. Get out there with your team and go and find that information. Uh, that's still out there. That's what we need to do. And unfortunately, there are a number of investigations over the years where the police perhaps didn't act uh, in, in a way that was quick enough to secure that, that evidence. And, and unfortunately, the one that will never be forgotten is the investigation into the uh, racist murder of Stephen Lawrence. Uh, and unfortunately, for, for that reason, amongst others, uh, there are a number of people who were involved in that uh, murder who are still uh, out and free and still basically cocking the snook at the justice system. But they did arrest uh, two of the, the murderers, Dobson and Norris, who are now serving prison sentences. But I'm afraid there are a number of others who uh, probably may never stand trial for Stephen's murder. So you need to go and take action and you need to do it quickly, is what the Golden Hour principle is saying. But it's not exactly a period of 60 minutes. Uh, no, indeed not. Uh, the, the longest Golden Hour I ever knew at a crime scene uh, lasted for three and a half weeks and that was a crime scene in a place called Cranage <clears throat> uh, a few years ago now during the murder of a lady called Diana Lee uh, who lived at the house and uh, the the scene was maintained kept open uh, kept secure for three and a half weeks and even at the end of three and a half weeks we were still recovering uh, items which were subsequently used as evidence in the crime court trial. So you should never be too quick to try and close a crime scene down. 
because unfortunately it's one of those situations where you can never be entirely sure that you've gathered every single piece of evidence that granted that three and a half week scene extremely complex awful lot going on in that crime scene um but it just goes to show that you shouldn't be too quick to close a scene down always get a second opinion always bring somebody else in to have a walk through another set of eyes and ears you might just say well hang on what about that there or what's this and, and it's something which you could have walked through that scene 50 100 times and never seen so you should never be afraid to peer review your own work uh, and ask somebody else to uh, to come and give you an opinion and as it says there it's not just about homicide this applies to everything it applies to the most simple and straightforward shoplifting and it applies to the most complex murder investigation so you're gathering evidence which is abundant readily available and by acting quickly and positively you minimize the risk of loss or damage to that evidence and you maximize the chances of it being admitted in evidence at the subsequent crown court trial so the things we think about we think about the safety and the welfare of the victim or complainant now of course in in homicide cases uh, the victim unfortunately is probably already dead but what we're thinking about is if there's a serious assault if there's a serious sexual offense such as a rape we're considering the victim first their safety their well-being is absolutely vital uh, we can we can get the evidence from them later as long as we're sure that they're safe in the first place so preservation of life is really important as well we identify any suspects or people that might be involved and we try to act as quickly as we can in order to arrest those people and secure and preserve evidence if it turns out after we've arrested somebody and i've done this quite a few times that the person we've arrested actually wasn't the person involved that's not necessarily a bad thing because if all roads point to somebody in the first instance and you take positive action to arrest them actually in this day and age with all the technology that's available to us you can prove it wasn't them and in many respects that to my mind that's just as good an outcome because it's good for them because it shows clearly they were not involved and it's good for you because it can it means you've got one person you can tick off your list completely uh, and not waste any more time uh, either investigating or doing further investigations into <clears throat> we identify intelligence opportunities what we're looking for there is other things that may have gone on in in an area uh, you know in, so if for example there's somebody found dead in their home we may be asking ourselves well have there been problems in the area with burglaries could it be a burglary that's gone wrong have there been uh, problems in the area with antisocial behavior where you know, young people have been misbehaving and terrorizing residents. Could it be that someone's had a confrontation with them? So we try and find as many of, of the facts, uh, the things that have been happening in that area round where the murder took place. Also, we look into any intelligence surrounding the victim themselves. Are they part of a criminal network? Have they got enemies? Have they been the victim of threats or problems in the past? So we try and build a picture not only of the area where the, the murder took place, but also of the individual. And I'll come on to the individual in a bit more detail in a little while. Scene assessments, obviously it's very important that we identify our scene or scenes sometimes. Some cases can have multiple scenes uh, and we need to make sure that all of those are secured and that they can be checked in due course because it isn't possible sometimes. I, I think the most scenes I've had on any particular case was about eight or nine in one day and you have to make sure that they're all secure and then we have to prioritize which one are we going to do first how long is it going to take how long do we need to protect those other scenes for have we got enough staff to go and look at all of those and check them all and sometimes that can be a bit of a logistical nightmare and that's where your uh, your csi or your crime scene investigator and there will be a csm a crime scene manager and a csc a crime scene coordinator and they will all come together with you and you can actually delegate that responsibility to them they will manage those scenes for you they will come back and report to you what they found if necessary you can go along put your paper suit on or your protective equipment and you can go into that scene with them and you can give direction if you so wish and that's something which i, I would tend to try and do as an sio because it's very difficult to picture a scene if you've not physically been there looked at it and made an assessment with your own eyes we try and identify key witnesses <clears throat> now they can be people who've actually witnessed what went on 
They can be people who've been told things later, who've heard things later. Uh, they can be people who perhaps were involved in a subsequent chain of events, such as an escape or something along those lines. Or they can be people who can give us specific information about either the victim or indeed the offender. So key witnesses are people who are quite likely to be asked to come and appear in court. That means we have to consider their safety and welfare too. Um, for example, if you're talking about a case where uh, the, the those involved are in the criminal fraternity, then of course they could be subject to threats uh, of violence, threats not to go to court. So there's all sorts of other logistical problems that can be associated sometimes with witnesses in a case. It isn't as simple and straightforward as just taking them to court. They take the oath and they give their evidence. A lot of the time it is. But obviously there are certain cases you come across where it's obvious that there are going to be problems and in the in the worst case scenario people sometimes need to be put into witness protection programs um, have their identities changed not the easiest thing in the world to do but believe me i've i've come across it and uh, it's problematic it's something which we have available to us but it's very very difficult to fully implement it uh, and it's a, a real uh, expensive uh, operation to keep someone safe 24 hours a day but it's something which we will do if we have to and it's something we'll certainly do if it's going to be the difference between a custodial sentence for somebody and somebody getting away with murder we consider wider appeals so we use the media uh <clears throat> try and use the media to uh, to good effect for ourselves uh, obviously the media is a, an interesting beast uh, there may be some in the audience who've worked in, in the media and uh, obviously from a police perspective it's trying to ensure that we, we use the media to the best effect, uh, giving them as much information as we feasibly can do, whilst trying to ensure that they, they work for us, reaching all the people that, that their particular um, media outlet will get to, whether it's internet based, whether it's a newspaper still, not as many of those around now as there used to be, particularly local ones, uh, whether they're a radio station or a TV station, whatever it might be, we will try and use the media to best effect. But of course, it all takes time. And from an SIO's perspective, in the first 24 to 48 hours of any investigation, uh, taking up uh, the, the time to give those uh, media interviews can sometimes, again, be problematic when there are so many different things that are coming at you and so many people who want a part of you uh, for, you know, those those first really important parts of a murder investigation. But my experience of the media has always been a very positive one. And I've always felt that uh, they, they've, they've helped the police uh, they've never misquoted me in fairness uh, nobody's ever misquoted me in the media so i'm always i've always been a big fan of, of using the media to try and and uh, and help the investigation and also more importantly to inform the public of what we're actually doing and to reassure the public that we're taking positive action that we are in charge you know that we are concerned about what's going on and we are taking action to try and bring those responsible to justice so i think it's a very important aspect of what we do victimology really really important there's an old saying in homicide investigations that if you find out how a person lived his or her life the chances are you'll find out who killed them and, and i would go along with that to a, a much much greater extent than than the idea that there are random homicides we do get random homicides but they are very very unusual and in my personal experience random homicides will normally involve a <clears throat> an offender who has uh, some kind of mental health issue. So in other words, uh, there's no connection between the victim and the attacker whatsoever until something happens. An example being, there was a case up the North Wales coast some years ago now, where a guy with some quite serious psychiatric uh, condition was walking his dog on the beach. Uh, another guy who he'd never met before was walking his dog and came the other way. The two dogs growled at each other uh, and that caused the murderer to then take a huge offence and stab the other gentleman many times in the head. Now, that's just completely and utterly random and totally unpredictable. Uh, and there are other cases like that up and down the country. So in situations like that, that can make your victimology quite difficult because clearly the victim never knew the attacker uh, and they're not going to feature in their life at all. But in the vast majority of cases, if you trawl through a victim's life and it can be quite an unpleasant process that at times um obviously you know you're coming across personal information which you would never have known unless that person had lost his or her life and then then comes a, a, a little bit of a problem in terms of what do we actually tell the family my adage has always been 
then I think that if, if there are some really horrible things that you learn about an individual, uh, I'll make a judgment. Is that information likely to come out in any subsequent court hearing, for example, a coroner's court or in the Crown Court trial? Is it something that's likely to be used by the defence against the victim to almost to dirty their name, even though they're dead and, and they can't speak for themselves? So if I think that that information is likely to come out, then as the SIO, I'll probably make a decision to uh, <clears throat> to go and sit down with the family in private and to brief them in a, in as sort of compassionate a way as possible about the information that we found in order to uh, allow them time to come to terms with it and to to be aware that it may well come out in, in any subsequent court case which they are present at and whilst they're still going to be upset uh, they're not going to be surprised because they know they've heard about it in the privacy and comfort of their own home they've heard it from me which i think is really important uh, and they've had op the opportunity to get their heads around it and to understand it before other people start to use that information in a quite unpleasant way, uh, making all kinds of suggestions and implications about their loved one who isn't in a position to defend their own reputation. So victimology, I, I always think when I've worked on homicide investigations, I've often ended up feeling like the victim was a friend of mine because I, I know so much about them. Uh, very often more than their family and close friends did. And you almost feel then that you're working on behalf of one of your close friends to try and get justice for them and to try and ensure that, that the right people, the people involved in, in their death are, are put where they belong. So <clears throat> victimology, very important. This day and age, mobile telephone data is massive. Um, of course, your mobile telephone, I'm sure most of you are users of mobile phones now, particularly the high tech ones such as your iPhones uh, and, and other similar phones like that. Uh, they carry so much information about you now. They know where you are 24 hours a day. Your phone is always with you. So if you have your GPS on or if you're, uh, you have your other those data services which track where you go, then clearly it's very helpful in terms of the police trying to establish a picture of a person's movements. Uh, of course, the calls you make, the texts that you send, the messages you receive, the different applications that you use on your phone, such as WhatsApp or all the other different ones that are available now, the huge sources of information about how people interact with each other and who the people are that you might be interacting with. So, you know, it's one of those situations where we will go through a person's life through their mobile phone, through their computers, again a very very impersonal uh, thing to do but absolutely essential in terms of trying to paint a picture of the individual themselves the way they live their life and therefore the likely candidates the people who may have committed uh, the crime against them so our search teams <clears throat> we will use those uh, again the, the very highly trained individuals and the search team they'll go through somebody's home again hopefully not making a mess but looking for things which are significant, looking for things which might have been left behind by an offender, looking for things which actually aren't there. So, so where is this particular item? Where's this particular thing which we believe the victim had? Where's it gone? And also they'll, they'll take the opportunity to search other areas where weapons may have been discarded or where items, personal items of clothing, things may have been dumped. If we think we've got a, a, a dump site where uh, a body's been found, then they'll conduct an extensive search in that area just to ensure that nothing else has been left behind or that things have been discarded or accidentally sometimes dropped by an offender, which can then lead us back uh, to them. A house to house, it's really important aspect of, of the inquiry. House to house is, is a lecture in itself, frankly, but it involves an awful lot of cross-referencing, particularly if you've got a, a large estate where something has happened and you're trying to establish who lives where, because believe it or not, you know, people do uh, live in houses, they don't declare who's there. Uh, we check with the neighbors, who've you seen coming back and to, and all this kind of thing. And house to house, particularly when you're looking for an offender on a large estate, is a very specialist role uh, and something which can take many, many days to fully complete because of, of the techniques that they use, but not something that's done particularly well. Uh, these days, I'm afraid to say. It's not something that's done uh, in any way near as thorough a fashion as it used to be. It was something that I personally tried to address just before I retired. Uh, and just before I retired in 2015, Cheshire and Stabbery weren't far off. Um, what it's like now, 
Uh, difficult to say, uh, if I'm being honest, because I'm not there anymore, but certainly house to house is something which is often overlooked, uh, but to my mind is a really important aspect of what we do. Other specialists and experts who you'll bring to the scene, and I'll talk about other specialists and experts in the next part of what I'm going to do. So I'll just hold off that for the time being. Uh, passive data opportunities, automatic number plate recognition. So we're looking for which vehicles have been moving around a particular area. CCTV, close circuit television, either on somebody's own house or the city centre, for example, in Chester, huge CCTV network, which we can call upon very high quality uh, colour, uh, obviously fantastic system. Also, some of the supermarkets such as Tesco's have fantastic CCTV. We can all help to paint a picture of an individual's movements around a town or a city or a location when you're trying to paint a picture of where they've been, who they've been with and what they've been doing. Uh, social media, <coughs> touched on that before, massive now part of a lot of people's lives. So if, even if we can't get into their social media accounts, we can find from their friends what posts they've been making when they were last active. And that can help us again paint a picture if a person's been murdered off the map completely. It can try and hope, hopefully give us an idea of, of when that offence may have taken place. When did they stop being active? What time did they suddenly disappear off the face of the earth and that can help us to again to, to put that picture together of that person's movements in the run-up to whatever's happened to them if we don't consider all these things then basically what can happen we don't consider our victim we lose vital information forever we don't obtain key uh, accounts and we don't obtain significant witness evidence and the whole credibility of the investigation goes out of the window and there's nothing worse you lose credibility as an SIO, as an investigation team, trying to pull that back uh, can often be impossible because it, it's gone. So <clears throat> these are the five building blocks of investigation. I touched on some of them briefly before. If you remember these five things, when you start an investigation off, you won't go far wrong. Preserve life, most important of all. Sometimes we'll even compromise evidence in order to preserve life. Preserve our scenes, secure our evidence, identify our victim. Who are they? Sometimes we don't know who they are at the beginning. Identify our suspects and back to our golden hour principles, take positive action. Let's get out there. Let's get our suspects arrested. Let's do what we need to do in order to demonstrate whether it is or isn't them. Because if it isn't them, as I said before, not a problem. We can put them to one side. We can dust them down. We can do what we need to do in order to demonstrate completely that it wasn't them. And then we can move on to look into who our, our other suspects may be. So categories of homicide, I'll touch on these very briefly. Category A+, plus, category A, category B, and category C. Uh, A+, plus is the homicide or other investigation where there's massive public concern and the associated response to such things as media intervention is such that we, we can't keep uh, going on it with our normal staffing levels. Recent times, a uh, category A+, plus murder, which you may remember down in Ipswich, where a number of uh, sex workers were murdered uh, and their bodies were being dumped all around the Ipswich area by a guy called Steve Wright, not the Radio 2 DJ. And uh, that was a massive investigation, a number of murder investigations all going on at the same time, but under the same umbrella. And there was staff being sent from all over the country uh, in what's called mutual aid to help on those investigations. Such was the demand upon uh, Sussex Police, which isn't a very big force, a bit like Cheshire, just couldn't cope. So they took staff from all over the country. We sent uh, a number of, of our colleagues to work there. Uh, and that operation all came together eventually. And Wright was imprisoned uh, quite rightly for the rest of his life. So uh, a category A homicide, uh, again, of grave public concern. We've got vulnerable members of the public at risk. The identity of the offender is not immediately apparent. And the investigation uh, and securing evidence requires significant resource allocation. Now, this is normally your force can normally cope with something like this. Uh, I came across a, an offence in a, a care home over in Congleton some years ago where a person who suffered from Alzheimer's and was unable to move at all uh, was set on fire in their bed. Horrible case. Um, massive public concern, of course. And unfortunately, we worked out it could have been somebody who'd actually got into the home uh, from outside. Large number of staff on that. Vulnerable members of the public were at risk, of course, because they were other residents of the home and we were concerned, what if somebody else got in and committed offences against them? So lots of staff working on that. It did turn out in the end that that case 
uh, was solved and it was a member of staff who committed the offence. Uh, so again, a horrible, a horrible case. Our concerns about somebody coming in from outside in the end weren't justified, but it's something we considered as a possibility. Um, category B, where you've got a situation where a homicide or the investigation where the identity of the offender is not apparent, but the risk to the public is low and the investigation or securing of evidence can be achieved with normal resources. Well, this tends to be cases where you think maybe one member of the criminal fraternity who you don't yet know has offended against another member of the criminal fraternity. So we, we think it could be related to some kind of um, dispute. We don't think this person is going to be running around the country attacking other people at random. And we've got a good chance of securing the information because we've got to different sources of information telling us what's gone on and the likelihood is we'll be able to uh, achieve the outcome uh, within the normal resources of, of the team in front of us. And finally, category C, this is a situation you might get, for example, some years ago, um, you, you get people phoning us up. I was in Northwich, a guy phoned up and he said, I've just killed my partner with a cricket bat. I went down to the address and sure enough, that is what had happened. So unless there's someone else involved that we don't know about, it seems fairly straightforward. This is the person. He's contacted us. He was still there when we got there. Sadly, his partner, his wife was dead. Uh, there was a cricket bat. All these things are seized. We still need to prove categorically that this is what's gone on and, and, and they hasn't just come home by mistake, you know, picked up the bat, suffered some kind of mental breakdown and, and thought to himself that he committed the offence. So we still have to prove it to make sure there's no other third parties involved who've escaped but on the face of it it's a fairly straightforward case so that those are the categories of homicide we'll as we talked about before with our incident room um we're looking for fast track actions things we can do immediately and if we do that we're likely to establish very important facts preserve evidence and hopefully resolve the investigation as early as possible and with our investigative strategies these are things that we do to identify main lines of inquiry establish the objectives why are we pursuing this line of inquiry what's the point identify any of the actions that will be raised in the incident room necessary to achieve those objectives efficiently and effectively thinking about things like cost human rights etc and we can direct our investigations so as to obtain further information and from that again we can generate fresh lines of inquiry so it's kind of a repetitive process but it's a very important one we deal with it on a step-by-step -step basis and hopefully by working in that methodical fashion it might come across as being a bit boring and a bit mundane but we have to do it that way and we do it that way and hopefully we end up having knocked over all the other possibilities and we reach the end of the line and we've got our offender in front of us and hopefully all the evidence that we need to convict him or her now in this day and age <laughs> It's very important that the police uh, record all their decisions. In, in years gone by, uh, police didn't record decisions. Uh, I'm afraid to say that probably one of the, the biggest uh, situations that ever arose uh, from that, from a lack of recording of decision making, was the Hillsborough case. Uh, I'm not going to go into that because uh, there may be people uh, in the audience who are affected by that in some way. All I'm going to say is that uh, I'm sure that the, the officers who were involved on the Hillsborough investigation wish that they'd recorded their decisions. Because if you don't record your decision, a famous Queen's Council QC called Michael Mansfield once said, if something isn't written down, it hasn't happened. Now, I'm not quite sure I agree fully with that because I've been to a lot of murders that weren't written down, but they were definitely murdered, definitely dead. But I know what he's saying. What he's saying is if you don't write down your decision making, if you don't write down your thought processes, then at the end of the day, it's not going to stand scrutiny. And he's right about that. So what we do with our decision making model, we gather all our information, we assess any threat and any risk to any person, and we build a strategy around that. We think about what our powers are in terms of the law, what we can do. We identify our options and we always have a backup or a contingency. If this isn't going to work, what else can we do? and finally we take action we do something and once we've done it we sit down with our peers we sit down with other interested parties we review what we've done and we ask ourselves what can we do differently next time did it work if so why did it work if not why didn't it work what went wrong what was it that we needed to do differently and it's really important 
that we, we do that and we reflect as practitioners and we learn from any errors or indeed that we learn from good practice and we keep on doing it. And in the middle is the police code of ethics. <clears throat> That's the way all police officers should behave. It comes out of the Nolan principles and it's basically a set of rules and regulations by which the police should behave and, and all our decisions should be in line with the code of ethics. So how would this work in a real case? Well, I'm gonna come out of this particular um, presentation now. Uh, Sue, can I just pause for a second and ask, are there any uh, questions that people might wanna ask uh, at this point before I share my other screen? Right, if anybody wants to ask a question, can you click the ask a question button? Uh, Simon, if you start sharing your screen, yeah. yeah. I have question for you i walk my dog in the morning with somebody who is a crime scene manager and she said to me more and more uh the police are advertising for it specialists uh and more and more you are detecting crimes by using it um she she quoted me it was a murder of a wife by a husband and part of the reason he was caught was because he walked into what was his ex-marital home and his mobile phone had connected to the router so Correct. is use of it specialists rocketing as much as i think it might be absolutely massive uh many of the audience today may have heard of the dark web uh yeah. which is is a, an area of the internet which most search engines like google don't even go near you can go on the dark web you can buy firearms you can buy explosives I, apparently I, I hasten to add uh, you can get anything you want on the dark web and most of the search engines don't touch it um we have specially or say police now specialist teams who are out there posing as uh, young children online to try and detect the activities of predatory paedophiles. But the information that you talk about there, every investigation now without fail involves technology of some kind or other. And of course, as I said before, your mobile telephones are really important. Bear in mind, and you see the, the important thing for me is I think technology not only helps to trap the guilty, but I also think technology helps to protect the innocent. Because if someone's trying to say that you were in a particular place, or doing a particular thing at a particular time, and you know very well that you weren't, then there's so many things now. Your mobile phone is one. Closed circuit television is another one. Uh, automatic number plate recognition of your vehicle is another one. Uh, your bank details and any transactions you may have made, all that information can be overlaid by an investigation to show quite clearly and categorically that you weren't there. There's a very famous case uh, a, very, a very sad case in many respects too the case of a guy called adam scott and adam scott was a, a young lad who lived down in uh, the plymouth area and he'd been arrested one night for some kind of a public order offense i think he'd spat at somebody which i know isn't particularly pleasant in itself but it's not the crime of the century he'd been arrested for public order and as a result uh, the police had taken a sample of his of his dna to be sent off to the laboratory to be loaded onto the system as with anybody who was arrested. Uh, he was later, uh, was the victim of a dreadful, dreadful mistake where uh, when his DNA was being processed at the laboratory, uh, they used the same Petri dish twice. And so they used a contaminated Petri dish which had his DNA in it whilst they were doing other work around a rape that had taken place in Manchester. And those of you that are, ra are racing ahead now in terms of what I'm, I'm saying, it's a hideous situation. His DNA was identified as being involved in this rape in Manchester, a place where he'd never been in his life. So the police went and arrested him. He was charged with rape. He was remanded in custody to Strangeways Prison in Manchester, where he spent four months on remand for an offence which it was actually physically impossible for him to have committed. And it was only because there was some work done around mobile telephony and somebody said, hang on, something not right here this lad's phone was down in plymouth for the entire time that this offense was taking place in manchester and he seems to be in like making and receiving calls and messages and what this, this something just doesn't add up here and after four months and i can only begin to imagine 
um, what four months on remand in, in, on a sex offender's wing in a prison would have been like for someone who, who never been in prison in his life and was probably never likely to be. Um, horrendous uh, error caused by a mistake in the laboratory, but actually put right by the work that had been done around mobile telephony and technology, which was fortunately for Scott, was able to prove Okay, uh, we do have another question, but I think I'll leave that to the end. If you can put up your next set of slides and... Yes, I do. I'll do that. I, I'm, I'm aware we're up around an hour now, so am I still okay to keep going? Yeah, keep going, but uh, yeah, keep going quickly. Wonderful. Okay, yeah. well, I'm, I'm now going to talk uh, briefly uh, to you about an investigation that I worked on going back uh, a few years now. It is on open source. It's it's in the media. It's it involves the the death of this guy here called Christophe Borgi, and Christophe was a, a French national who lived over in uh, Ellesmere Port at an address on the Stanley Estate. And I'll come back to this slide in a moment. And he lived with these three people here. Um, on the left, in the in the blue slazinger top, is a guy called Sebastian uh, Bendu, a French national. In the middle, with the beard, is a guy called Dominic Kotcher, another French national. And on the right, with the glasses, is a guy called uh, Manuel Wagner, who's a German uh, national. And, and these three people were all associates of uh, Christophe. And just to sort of uh, set the scene in terms of what happened with this particular case, Christophe, as it says there, was a an air steward. He worked for Ryanair and was based in uh, Liverpool Airport, John Lennon Airport over in Liverpool there. And he used to travel back and to from Ellesmere Port to work. And, and the uh, the individuals concerned that I've mentioned there, together with Dominic Koch's wife and children, lived in two houses in an address at Hilton Court on the Stanley Estate. Kotcher and his wife and children lived in one house. Christoph. Uh, Sebastian Bendu and Manuel Wagner lived in another house just across the close. And it was one of the most bizarre arrangements I think I've ever seen in my whole entire life, whereby Dominic Kotcher was something of a control and influence over all these individuals we subsequently established. He used to take all their money off them and pay them a, like a weekly allowance uh, from, from what they'd given to him. All their meals were prepared at, at his house by his wife and taken across to their address. A very, very unusual uh, arrangement, very, very strange, quite controlling. Um, but uh, it, it's a, it was a strange situation which only came to light after the investigation started. And of course, the investigation itself originally began on the 17th of May at 2009. Now, Christoph at that point was reported missing to the police by his work colleagues. Uh, a guy from uh, Ryanair who he worked with, he was actually a Russian national, who contacted the police and said, um, you know, I haven't seen Christoph since the 23rd of April. So almost a month had gone by um, before this, this guy, this Russian guy, saw fit to report him missing. But what concerned me, or what, or what would have concerned me had I been involved in it at the time, would have been quite simply this. If you're reported missing from home, then I would expect that the people who would report you missing would be the people you live with, because they are the people who you would see on a day-to-day -day basis. They're the people who think, well, hang on, Simon went out to work at nine o'clock this morning. It's now 10 past eight in the evening. He hasn't come back. This is quite unusual for Simon. We can't raise him on his mobile telephone. Uh, there's no sign of him at any of, uh, any of his friends. We don't know where he is. We're a little bit concerned now. Um, and we'd had no contact whatsoever as Cheshire Police from either Dominic Kotcher or any of the other players involved in this. And that really, in truth, should have set alarm bells ringing at the time, but it didn't. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit sad to say. So all I can say, I think with some degree of certainty, is that by the 17th of May 2009, Christoph Borshi was dead. And that's probably the only saving grace, really, in, in a case like this, because uh, had he not been dead, had he been held hostage, uh, some time uh, around that time and we, we'd not done the things we should have and it probably could have been quite embarrassing but I think there's no doubt he was dead 
So basically, he was reported missing. And as it is normal with a, a missing persons case, uh, the police attended at the addresses at number 10 and number 19 Hilton Court and questions were asked. But unfortunately for the police officers, uh, Dominic Kotcher and Sebastian Bendu both gave false accounts of where they believe Christoph was. Uh, we think it's clear to say now they knew very well that he was dead at that point. But they said that he left the UK uh, and unfortunately uh, we didn't necessarily do the checks we could have done to establish whether he had or hadn't left the UK. Uh, and in the end, um, Dominic Kotcher contacted the police on the 28th of May, saying that he'd spoken to Christophe's brother in France, that's where all the rest of his family were, that he'd heard from him, had an email from him, and that everything was okay. Uh, and actually no such conversation had ever taken place and no such email had ever been sent. So as a result of that, the whole investigation was scaled back in 2009 uh, as Christoph was presumed or assumed to be abroad. Now, I mentioned before, don't presume or assume anything. Check everything out. And it would have been uh, helpful if certain checks had been made, for example, with the passport agency, uh, with the UK Border Force, as they're now called, uh, with companies such as Ryanair to check flight manifest. It's not difficult, but some of those things weren't done. Periodic reviews of the case were conducted, but after that, it's fair to say that it, the trail basically went dead. We move forward four years. So a whole four years has gone by uh, where no sign of Christoph, very little has been done in terms of trying to find him. And on the 13th of May in 2013, Sebastian Bendu, who by this time had moved with the rest of the group to Scotland, came back to Ellesmere Port, walked into Ellesmere Port Police Station and said, uh, I'm responsible for a killing in 2009. And it's fair to say there was laughter because uh, unfortunately, as part of being a police officer, we tend to get lots of people uh, who want to come into police stations and admit to things that actually have never happened. And it does cause us quite a few problems because sometimes some of them can be quite convincing and you can end up doing quite a lot of work. Uh, and then finding out that the whole thing is complete and utter nonsense. But in this case, uh, a detective happened to be in the vicinity and said, well, hang on, I seem to recall we did have somebody of that name who went missing in 2009. I don't think he was ever found. So wheels started to move and uh, <clears throat> Sebastian was arrested. Uh, my team got involved. I was involved as a mentor in that particular case. The SIO was a good friend of mine, a guy called Gwyn Dodd. And this was the first murder that he'd ever actually worked on. So I was working closely with him in the role of, of mentor, sort of sitting on his shoulder, allowing him to run the investigation, but obviously just making, you know, useful or hopefully useful suggestions as the investigation went on. And because of my role, I was going with him to most of the places that we went to. And as Bendy was arrested, he took us to the address in Hilton Court, where they previously lived. And he said, this is where his body is. He said, uh, we, we, we buried him in this building here. And I'll show you some images in a second. None of them uh, too disturbing, just uh, to paint a picture of what went on. Uh, we, we found, as I said before, that the rest of the group had moved to Scotland. So while we were doing this work in Ellesmere Port, moves were already underway to send teams of people up to Scotland to ensure that we arrested the rest of the individuals, Golden Hour Principal, let's get staff on the road, let's get them up to Scotland, and let's make sure we get everybody we want where we want them before we start interviewing people, before people start running around and destroying evidence, etc., etc. So Sebastian takes us to an address in Hilton Court, and this is the address. And you can see there there's a, an outhouse just through the gate. And if you look to the left of the picture, you'll see that next door, just on the edge of the picture there, they've got an outhouse as well. And all the houses on that estate had an outhouse. I don't know, but I'm guessing that they may have been outside toilets in, in years gone by. But what they were now is simply storage sheds. And if you look at the next picture, that's from inside the gate. <clears throat> then obviously what you had to do was enter through the door and you could basically only turn right because there's a wall in front of you and there's a wall to the left of you. So you walk in and inside, and, and it's actually against the wall where the, the, the white thing is. So you've turned right and this is the far wall. There's a step 
And unless you've been in every single other outhouse on that estate, you wouldn't know that this was the only outhouse that had a step. And as you can see, it's, cre it's been created by building a brick wall at the front of it. Uh, and then obviously by doing that, there would originally have been a cavity behind that wall. And into that cavity has been placed the body of Christophe Borgi, and he's then been encased in concrete. So what do you do? How do you go about recovering a body from concrete like that? Well, it's actually quite an interesting and, and, and a complicated and fascinating technique. What we did, we first of all stopped because you don't start getting your hammer and chisel out and chipping away and bits of concrete flying everywhere. You have to remember that this is a potentially a scene of, uh, of great evidence. Someone has built this, someone has constructed this tomb, and the chances are that while they were doing it, they've either put things in there, bits of them may have fallen off, pieces of hair or whatever. So to take that tomb to pieces, to effectively recover what's inside it, namely the body of Mr. Borgia in a respectful and compassionate way, but still making sure that you gather the evidence, is painstaking. So you're thinking to yourself, right, who on earth is going to do this? <clears throat> and actually, through a, a forensic organisation called Selmar Forensics, we came across uh, two forensic archaeologists. So they came to the scene, they looked at it and they said, yep, yeah, we can do this for you, but it's very important that we do this in a way that's going to preserve evidence because this is concrete. And believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, there are in this country, as there are around the world, concrete experts. I can't think of a much more boring job, to be perfectly honest. What do you do for a living? Well, I'm a concrete expert. Oh, right, really? How interesting. Um, and what these people do, as their name might suggest, is they are capable of analysing concrete and giving you a chemical breakdown of all the different constituents within that concrete. So which cement was used, which sand was used, what type of gravel was used, even breaking it down to the components of some of the water that was involved. So you think, so this is really complex. This is a really important uh, role in this particular case because we need not only to recover that body from that tomb but we also need to recover the parts that were used to make that tomb the bricks the mortar all the concrete that's been used to encase that body and we need to try and build the, the, the a picture of its chemical constituents so we can try and establish where it's all come from really important so <clears throat> this is what they did it took two days painstaking process so as we can see, we're, we're, we're going down and down. There's a tarpaulin there, which uh, which the body of Christoph was wrapped in. Uh, we then recover the body. We take it for post-mortem. And the Home Office pathologist, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Paul Johnson from Liverpool, man for whom I've got great respect, uh, he conducted the post-mortem examination and concluded that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. The body itself was actually very, very well preserved. Considering it had been uh, encased for four years, uh, it was obviously encased in concrete and therefore it wasn't um, able to be accessed by the air, first of all. And secondly, it couldn't be accessed by creatures. So the body itself was in quite good condition. I still don't think it would have been realistic to have brought a relative in and asked them to conduct an identification. That was still done uh, via other means. But in terms of preservation, in terms of enabling the pathologist to conduct the, the examination, the post-mortem examination, the body was still in, in a very good condition. Uh, and he concluded the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. And as I mentioned before, uh, <clears throat> the importance of taking that tomb apart uh, in a very controlled manner was, was uh, emphasised by the fact that the offenders had actually buried the hammer and the knives that had been involved in the murder in the tomb with the body and the doctor was able to conclude that those weapons uh, match the injury sustained by the victim so i think what a stupid thing to do why would you bury the weapons that you used in the murder with the body well i honestly don't know that's something i would personally do but they did and that was a, a big help uh, to us as the investigation progressed that's just a computer generated image which shows uh, you we use these in court because obviously they, they are unpleasant but uh, they're, they're not the real photographs from uh, either the post-mortem or the crime scene. So, you know, we, we have no wish to upset 
uh, people. We don't wish to have, have jury members uh, running out of court or fainting. So we just used computer generated images to demonstrate that this was where uh, the, the victim was struck uh, a number of times, as you can see, uh, with a hammer. Uh, and obviously that was unfortunately what, uh, what caused uh, his death. So <clears throat> our main lines of inquiry in that particular case, financial investigations. So what we're looking to do, even though it's four years ago, banks are pretty good at keeping financial records. Mobile phone companies, I'm afraid, not so good um, because they are more profit orientated and less concerned about helping law enforcement agencies. But the building materials uh, it was very important we established where they come from. We were able to establish where the bricks had come from, the concrete, the cement, the sand had all come from a local builder's merchant where Dominic Kotcher had an account. So we were able to match up his financial transactions with records from the local builder's merchants and able to demonstrate that around the time of the murder, he had bought all the items that had been used in the construction of the tomb. Our experts were able to say that categorically, and we were able to overlay that with our financial evidence to show, well, you bought this stuff, and guess what? This stuff has now been used to make this tomb in which this man's body has been found. So very, very powerful evidence linking Kotcher with the murder of uh, Christoph. <clears throat> we made email investigations. We were able to check out and show that the email that had been received by Christoph Borgi's brother hadn't come from somewhere else in the world. It had actually come from Ellesmere Port, uh, which was no surprise given that uh, Christoph was already dead when it was sent and that it had probably been sent by Kotcher or one of the other offenders. And we conducted some telephone investigations into a SIM card. That's obviously the little card that goes into your uh, mobile telephone. That was also recovered in the tomb, again, quite foolishly. Uh, we think, and we were able to demonstrate that uh, even though it had been damaged to some extent, we were able to show it was a, a SIM card which belonged to Christoph and which obviously had been used in his mobile phone prior to his death. <clears throat> so that's very much of a, of a sort of uh, a, a short picture, if you like, of the way we use those techniques to pull together all the information in a case. It resulted in uh, Kotcher and Wagner standing trial together, Kotcher being convicted and sentenced to life with a minimum term of 23 years. Wagner was initially found not guilty of all offences. Uh, Bendu, although he had some serious uh, psychiatric uh, condition, was deemed fit to stand trial, uh, and he was subsequently found guilty of murder, although he claimed diminished responsibility, and he was sentenced to uh, life with a minimum term of 14 years. And we move on a couple of years, <clears throat> and further inquiries were carried out, uh, Bendu gave evidence in his in his trial which appeared to implicate Wagner in the murder. And subsequently, he was rearrested in charge and was convicted on the 28th of June 2017 after Bendu was produced from prison and gave evidence against him. So all three of those offenders are now in custody, I'm pleased to say. And as it says there, it, quite a lot of work and took quite a period of time, but an all-round um, justice outcome for uh, Christophe Borgi is, is how... Uh, we see that. And that kind of brings me um, to the end of uh, my presentation. So yeah. if, if there are questions, I've not done away an hour and there are interesting questions. Um, yeah. First question, do unsolved murder cases always remain open? That one's from yeah. Chris Robinson. Yes, they do. Uh, different forces will have a, a different practice in place. But um, if, for example, uh, I mean, I, it's not a murder case, but I, I know about a, a, a case that I worked on going back to about 2007, which was a, a rape stroke serious sexual offences case. And DNA was recovered from both scenes and is now on the National DNA database. But we don't know who the offender is. Uh, so that person is still out there somewhere. Uh, his DNA wasn't on the database, so couldn't be compared. And to our knowledge, he's never come uh, to, to police notice since, because had he done so, his DNA would have been sent to the National DNA database, would have been compared against all the outstanding cases that are on the system, and we would have had a name by now. So the same applies with murder cases. Um, excuse me, I don't think you can hear that. There's a, a light aircraft 
or helicopter going over my house, but it seems to have gone now. I can't hear it. No. So, so yes, all, all cases will remain open, and obviously DNA techniques are moving on all the time. So, uh, you know, if if they have got a case, for example, where there was quite a poor uh, DNA stain, they will constantly try and rework those over a period of time in order to obtain a profile for comparison. Um, and of course, the other thing as well about um, murder cases, if you've got a case, for example, that involved a, a couple of gangs of people 20 or 25 years ago, um, time moves on and people move on and people's allegiances change and people grow up. So whereas you and I, Sue, might have been as thick as thieves 30 years ago while we were going around Chester yeah. and yeah. people up and taking their money from them, um, I might have continued that way of life, but you might have become a born again Christian, for example, and, and decided that you want to go to the police and confess everything that you've done in your life uh, and tell them about me as well. We've had that happen. Or yeah. people will simply move on in their lives. They grow up and they realize that, that they don't want to be involved in crime anymore uh, and they, some, their allegiance will change and, and they will go to the police and say, look, I know who did that murder in 2000. Um, I, I wasn't party to it, but I know they did it. I know they hid the weapon in so-and-so. And so it's not always technology that helps us to solve um, undetected crimes. It's sometimes it, it's simply people's personal allegiances changing. But no, to answer the question, um, all undetected homicides, certainly in this country, will always remain the subject of constant review against new techniques that are coming to light and against any new evidence that might have come to light. Interesting. OK, uh, another question from Richard Tatton. It's a very interesting talk. You mentioned North Wales a couple of times. Does Cheshire police often work in North Wales? Do they cooperate uh, across borders? They, they do cooperate closely. If if you happen uh, to give an example of what's happening right up to, 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 to today, uh, I saw someone on social media saying, I can't believe I've seen a North Wales police vehicle in Warrington uh, going into McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Well, the chances are that will have been a North Wales Police BMW X5, and mm -hmm. North Wales and Cheshire Police now have a joint firearms unit. So uh -huh. if, if you see uh, a, a North Wales Police liveried uh, vehicle with a uh, headley, it looks like head loo, doesn't it? You know, it, it's headley yeah. Welsh for um, police. If you see a, a North Wales Police liveried BMW driving around Chester, that the chances are that's an armed response vehicle. So uh, it, it means that it, which they, they will operate with so many ARVs, as they're known, across Cheshire and North Wales at any given time. And if there's a, a firearms incident that comes in, you might get a Cheshire vehicle deployed to it. You might get a North Wales vehicle deployed to it. You might get both. Okay. All uh, right. Th th there are some political implications because clearly – you know, Wales and the Welsh Assembly and, and the UK government. But I actually think it makes perfect sense because uh, North Wales uh, is, is a corridor. Uh, you know, you do get quite a lot of criminals from Liverpool and Manchester who operate along the North Wales coast. And they have to come through Cheshire in order to do that. So I, I think that the collaboration between the two forces is very important. And I hope it continues for a long time. OK, thank you. Uh, and the, what I think will have to be the last question because we're running out of time. Uh, do you watch crime dramas and what makes you shout at the TV? Uh, I do watch crime dramas. I've got a foam brick that I keep by the side of my chair, <laughs> which I can yeah. throw at my television. Uh, the, the one thing that really, really winds me up more than anything else uh, about crime dramas on the television is the misrepresentation in terms of what goes on at crime scenes. So you, you will have um, half a dozen people in the full paper suit with the hood up and the mask on, the goggles and the gloves, all doing it properly. And then the SIO, someone like me, walks in in a suit and tie, smoking yeah. a cigarette, coughing and spitting everywhere, scratching their head, bits of dandruff falling off. It absolutely drives me insane. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wish they would um, represent truly the, the, the real professionalism that exists out there in terms of, you know, my ex-colleagues now you, you know I, I i can't praise highly enough the work that goes on in respect to crime scenes homicide investigations in general uh, but the misrepresentation on the television which you know look the vast majority of people in the general public don't interact with the police don't know what goes on would assume that went on if that went on every case would fall over 
uh, at court on the basis that it's been forensically compromised. So you, you simply cannot have that sort of thing going on. And, and that's probably the, the thing that annoys me the most is um, I, I just wish they'd do their research better. If, if they make, if they're make a TV programme, I, I know, you, you, as I said before, about central characters, but if you're going to show techniques, at least, at least show them properly and at least give them you know, due respect, really. I, I always get upset when they come up with IT solutions to things in about 30 seconds. And I know it takes hours to do some of this stuff. Yeah. 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 You have to work at it. Well, that was really fascinating. Thank you very, very much for, for doing that, Simon. I think we have come to the end of the broadcast. Uh, the audience has stayed with us. So I think they were all very gripped by that. Yes. And uh, thank you all for being here this morning. I'm going to end the broadcast now. And Simon, I'll give you a ring later. Thanks, everyone.